Today I receive all of God's love for me. Today I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today I open myself to God's Word. So I become more like Jesus every day. Today I proclaim that I'm God's beloved. I'm God's servant. I'm God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Paul, 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 what did you write? The sins, the chains, the sorrow, the tragedy, and the story. We break the shackles, we fix the discords, coast to coast, overseas, in the pain, above the rim, oh, we suffer, but didn't stop there. Pero bakit kasalanan ko? Parang kasalanan ko. We're timing in, we're on the switch, we in the hymn house, the real Jeezy, the Saints gang. Rhyme and dance and praising, singing. No breaks, no limits, he is calling. We on the stage, off live, flashing lights, camera, action. Fighting bad guys, loving bad guys, on the runway, doing his way. Taking off from the cross line, we in spirit on bars. Here we go. Speaking of bars, word for today. Are we loving thy neighbors now? The Saints. Messy saints. Yeah. Believe that. We're going to take a page from the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But before I read to you the, this passage, I want you to know that we are on the fourth installment. We're almost wrapping up in our series, Messy Saints. This is the fourth talk, and we've been talking about the different problems that the people of Corinth have been experiencing. Uh, I, I, I wish I had time to list down all the problems, but let me give you the fourth one. If you need a recap, you can go through our history in our Facebook channel and YouTube channel, and you can go through uh, all the different talks that we've had. The fourth problem that we're going to talk about today is about how the people of Corinth were gifted, but they, were, they had divisive members. And I pray that the Lord ministers this to you. So we're taking a page from the book of Corinthians, first. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and chances are, if you've ever sat through a wedding, either you got married or somebody you know got married, you would be very familiar with this piece of scripture, unless you were too busy or occupied, you know, staring at the beautiful bridesmaids, then it would be a different story, but you would, be, you would know what this piece of scripture is, and Paul is speaking this, he says, if I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor, and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And then he says the most beautiful words. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Can you say that? Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Can you shout out? Love will last forever. And then Paul says, when I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. And then he says, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. And then he says in chapter 14, verse 1, Let love be your highest 
goal. Can you touch your neighbor and say, let love be your highest goal? In fact, can you preach that to yourself? Put your hand over your chest and say this with me. Love is my highest goal. Amen. I want to, that's our big word by the way. I said it earlier, let love be your highest goal. I want to take you through a timeline of how social media has evolved in this world. If I talk about social media, what is the, 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 the most uh, trendy social media platform nowadays? Not Facebook, TikTok, right? But before there was TikTok, there was Snapchat. How many of you are familiar with Snapchat? All right, very few people. Before there was Snapchat, there was Twitter. How many of you know Twitter? Raise your hand. All right, got some tweeters here. Before there was Twitter, there was Facebook. I'm pretty sure that most of you are, are in Facebook, yes? But before there was Facebook, there was Multiply. Did you ever go through Multiply? Some of you probably sold some stuff in Multiply. Before there was Multiply, there was MySpace. Do you remember MySpace? Yeah? And then before there was MySpace, of course, there was Friendster. Right? That revolutionized social media and, and everything. But before there was Friendster, there was I C Q. I'm losing the young people here. How many of you remember I C Q? Raise your hand. You remember I C Q? Uh, you, you, some of you, you the, the young people here, you guys don't know the struggle. You see, ICQ, just to tell you, ICQ was a chat room where you could enter and you could chat with anybody. This is the first time in history where you could actually chat with, the, with any person around the world. You could be chatting with somebody in England or Germany or Europe and you wouldn't know who they were. And this is where that, that, that term was invented, ASL. You ever heard of that? What does ASL mean? Age, sex, location. So if somebody says ASL, you would give, you know, the year that you were born or how old you were. You would give your gender and then you would give where you were located. ASL, you know, that's ICQ. And some of you don't know the struggle because back in the day when you were in ICQ, what was the struggle? It was the internet connection. Remember that? The dial-up? Oh, you, the young people, you, you, you have so much blessing with Wi-Fi. The dial-up connection, some kids nowadays, they complain about Wi-Fi. I'm bagal ng Wi-Fi. You know, 10 Mbps. What is this? Jurassic era? No. Back in the day in the dial-up, you know, you got disconnected every 30 minutes. Why? Because you ran out of load. And then you needed another scratch card. Yung ISP. Or the second reason why you got disconnected? Because somebody lifted the landline. Bawal kasi yun. Pag, pag, pagkabuhat mo ng landline, ang igay, di ba? The dial-up connection. And then, you know, whenever you connected, you heard that most horrible sound. You remember that? That was the most horrible sound. So the young people, the generation alpha, I'm telling you, you guys are so blessed because of Wi-Fi now. So don't complain as much. But you know, before I seek you, and I'm going to speak not to the titos, I'm going to speak to the lolos and lolas. Before I seek you, what was the thing that you used so that you could get to know one another? It sounded a little bit like Facebook. It was called the Slambook. Slam book. Now, if there's a young person beside you, tell them about the slam book later on, right? The slam book was a notebook where it asked you a bunch of random questions so that you can get to know your friend, right? You know, questions like, what is your favorite color? What is your motto in life? Or your favorite question, who is your crush? Worried the worried. Paano kung basahin to ni crush? But a part of you wanted your crush to read that para magkaalama na, di ba? And then, for me, the hardest question that the slam book always had, and I'm pretty sure that you can relate to this if you've ever answered this, because this was a time when you couldn't Google for the answer. 
It needed to be a personal answer. And imagine you're 10 years old and then this question is being asked. What is the question? Ask me what? What is love? 10 years old ka, tapos tatanungin, what is love? So titingnan mo yung sagot ng mga ibang kaibigan mo. So kopyain mo, diba? Love is a four-letter word. Love is a many splendored thing. Now, love is blind. So you see, love has many definitions. How many of you agree with me? There's a lot of definitions about love. You know, people will say love, you know, soft as an easy chair. Love, fresh as the morning air. There's a lot of definitions of love, but hear me out, all right? When it comes to love, I believe that there is nobody other than Paul who best described it. To me, that's the love that really depicts the kind of love that only God can give. That's the reading that we just read. And Paul is the one that really got so close to love. In fact, the Greeks have four ways to define love. Let me give you a quick history lesson. The first kind of love, the Greeks called it... I forgot. No, they called it storge. Storge is love for family. You know, your love for your brother, your love for your sister. There's another kind of love, it's called philia. Philia is your brotherly love, your sisterly love. This is the kind of love that you don't want the person you're courting to give you. And you know that they're giving you philia love when they call you kuya or, or tito. Sa guano, di ba? Friend zone ka. That, that's the kind of love that you don't want. There's another kind of love I forgot. What is the first kind of love? It's eros. There you go. Eros is erotic love or sensual love. But there is that one kind of love the deepest form kind of love that only God can give and it's called agape. Everybody say agape. Agape is God's love. That's love without limits, love without bounds, love that recognizes no space and time. That's the kind of love that only God can give. And, and that's what Paul is saying here, that God's love is agape love. But you see, one common mistake that people have whenever they read 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is they think, well, that's, you know, love. Romantic love. Because, you know, they use it in weddings, they use it in relationships, and true enough, yes, we use it in every wedding ceremony. But is that the reason why Paul even wrote it in the first place? Is that right? That it's about romantic love? How many of you say yes? Raise your hand. How many of you say no? Raise your hand. How many of you are just afraid to raise your hand? Let me give you the answer. It's not about romantic love. It's not. How do I know that? Because of what Paul writes before that. In fact, I'm going to read it to you. If you backtrack and go backwards one chapter before this, Paul is not giving advice to boyfriends and girlfriends. He's not giving advice to wedding couples. In fact, what Paul is saying is he's talking about spiritual gifts. All right? So he says... In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he says to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. And the same Spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles. That's another gift. And another, the ability to prophecy. He gives somebody else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. And still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. Now, if you're new to the charismatic renewal movement, some of these words might be you know, alien to you. But if you've been part of the charismatic movement, you would know all of these spiritual gifts, like the gift of prophecy. How many of you know that? There's a gift of healing, the gift of faith, the gift, the, the most famous gift of all, speaking in tongues, right? And what Paul is saying is that, yes, all of these people from Corinth, they had all these spiritual gifts. They were a gifted nation, but that became the problem. Because they focus too much on their gifting that they forgot everybody else. In other words, they celebrated their gifting and then they didn't celebrate anything else. For instance, if you're somebody who had all these spiritual gifts or some of these spiritual gifts, they celebrated you. 
But sadly, if you're not gifted, if you don't have any of these gifts, you were put down. Do you know that this still happens in society today? That sometimes we celebrate those who are truly gifted and then we put down those who aren't? Like picture this incident with me. A father is complaining about his two children. And he's saying, I just don't understand it. You know, my youngest, my, my, my eldest daughter, she's so smart. She's a summa cum laude. But my youngest son, I don't know, he's also a summa. Summa sablai. I mean, he, he's, he's a good kid. It's just that he's dumb. Parents, raise your hand. All the parents, all the parents, raise your hand. You need to know this truth, all right? Listen to me. Are you listening? Say, I'm listening. I need you to know this. That here's the truth. Each of your children, especially if you've got more than one kid, each of your children are bright. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? They're just bright in different ways. Yes? Psychology says that there are nine different kinds of intelligences. I'll give you some of them. There's an intelligence called naturalistic intelligence. A new naturalistic intelligence. That's a kind of person who is intelligent to the world. He knows nature. He's close to nature. Do you know any person in your life who you give a dead plant to that person, that person can revive that plant within a week? Nabubuhay. Right? That person has a naturalistic intelligence. Other kinds of example, people who are close to animals. They're like dog whisperers or cat whisperers. You know? They have naturalistic intelligence. Another kind of intelligence, it's the uh, musical intelligence. Raise your hand if you've got musical intelligence. You translate really well when it comes to music and vibration and sound. You can communicate using that kind of intelligence. There's another intelligence called logical, mathematical intelligence. Yan yung mga matatalino sa math. Taas ang kamay na magaling sa math. Amen. All right, that's mathematical. You're, you're an analytical. You're very wise when it comes to logic. There are other people who have what you call interpersonal intelligence. Alam niyo ba yon? Matalino sila. They know how people behave. They know what people are thinking. They know how people feel. They're intelligent in that sense. And then there are other people who have what you call spatial intelligence. Not it's not special, it's S-P-A-T-I-A-L. Look at the person beside you. Do they look like they have special intelligence? But you tinatawanan. Spatial means space and time. And these are the people who would eventually become architects and designers and map readers. So what am I saying? I'm simply saying that there is no child in this world who is plain dumb. It's just that they're just wise in a different way than you. So parents, please, I'm speaking to you right now. Don't ever compare your son and your daughter or your other child to one another. And you might say, Bakit hindi ka kasing talino ng kapatid mo? Bakit hindi ka suma cum laude? Bakit ikaw iba ka? Because they're different. They're intelligent in their own way. Some might be good at math. Some might be good at playing the guitar. Some might be a good athlete. Some might be good at relationships. You get what I'm saying? I think that the most common mistake that parents have is that they would treat gifts as the highest goal. That's wrong. Love should be your highest goal. Love should be your highest goal. In fact, here is a truth that you can tweet about today. Listen to me. Maturity. It's not about how gifted and talented you are. Maturity is about how loving you are. When you look at Jesus, Jesus is here around us. But when you look at the image of Jesus, have you ever heard somebody say, I want to be as gifted as Jesus? I want to be as talented as Jesus. No. When you look at Jesus, first thing you think is, I want to be as loving as Jesus. I want to be as patient as Jesus. I want to be as generous and merciful like Jesus. Because when Jesus came, He never preached about His gifting. He never preached about His talents. You know what He preached about? Ask me what? He preached about the love of God. 
Because to him, love is the highest goal. That's why Paul is saying, you know, prophecy, yes, it's a blessing. Knowledge is a blessing. Speaking in tongues, it's a blessing. Faith is a blessing. But Paul is saying that you can have all these spiritual gifts in your life. You can be the most talented person that walks in the room. You can be the most gifted singer here on stage. You can be the most award-winning athlete in the gym. But without love, oh, without love, all of these gifts will be meaningless. It's nothing. Are you hearing what I'm preaching? It's nothing. And what's amazing about that is that if you look at that from the opposite spectrum, Paul says that if you've got love, you've got nothing. But if you've got all the, for instance, if you don't have any talent or gift whatsoever, but you've got love, Paul is saying you've got everything. Because love is the highest goal. No wonder Jesus said three things will remain. What? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is what? Shout it out. Love. love. Why is love the greatest? Why is love the greatest among faith, hope, and love? I'll give you two reasons. Number one, because love lasts forever. Think about this. When you get to heaven, will you still need faith? When you're up in heaven? No, right? Because you're already face to face with your God. Will you still need hope when you're in heaven? No, because you've, you're already with Jesus. What hope do you have to need? But love, on the other hand, you will continue to love God and you will continue to grow in that love day by day in heaven. First reason, because love lasts forever. And here's the second re reason. Because God is love. Can you say that? God is, love. God is love. God doesn't need to have faith because He doesn't need to trust outside of Himself. And God doesn't need to hope for anything. Why? Because He knows the past, present, and future. What does He need to hope for? But God is personified by love. That's why God is love. That's why God, or rather, that's why love lasts forever. So now when I ask you, how would you define love? I mean, love has so many definitions, but when you have love, my friend, I mean, you can have the, the, the simplest definition of love, and that can be your definition of love, but I want to end this way by giving you one thing that love can do. And Jesus showed it to us. And I'll tell this to you through the story of my dad. When I was... Uh, when I was young, I wasn't very close to my dad. I mean, we had a father-son relationship, but it wasn't really close. Like, I didn't really know his story. When my dad was growing up, when he was one year old, he got accidentally shot in his right eye by his three-year-old cousin, who was the son of a soldier. He lived in Mai Hai Laguna. That was his province. And the, the cousin was toying around with a gun. He was in the adjacent room. Nakalabit niya. Nabaril, and then the bullet entered through the room where my dad was in, entered through the back of his head and then out his eye. So all his life, my dad was blinded. He only had one eye. So, you know, growing up, he had to wear sunglasses, just like that. When he was in grade school, high school, all the way until he was very old, he had to wear these sunglasses. And he couldn't do a lot of normal things that, you know, normal people like you and me could do. He couldn't do sports couldn't do basketball, I couldn't do football or soccer because he was impaired with just only one eye. In fact, one of the normal things that we enjoy every day is driving. My dad was also a driver, but he couldn't drive fast. Why? Because his peripheral vision here on the right side, it was blinded. Can you do this example with me just very quickly? Can you cover your right eye? Just cover it. You see that blind spot? You don't know if the person on your right is making a face at you and you don't know? Right? It's blinded. So my dad, he had to turn his head very quickly. You know, he had the muscles, of neck muscles as big as Arnold Schwarzenegger's biceps probably. Because, you know, he could turn it very, very fast. Until, and I will prove it to you that, that he, he had, you know, all of these gifts that he, was, he, was, uh, that he lived with. Because um, when I was 13 years old, I, 
I didn't understand why my friends would always ask me, why is your dad wearing sunglasses even during at night? And I didn't know until I was 13 years old. I walked in on him and he was by the dresser. He, it looked like he was brushing something. And as I got closer, I saw, to my shock, that he was brushing a plastic eye. It was out of his socket. And from that moment on, I, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, my dad is the Terminator. Grabe, <laughs> cyborg. But you know, one thing that happened, so my dad was handicapped. And then we had a family reunion many years ago while, while he, he was still alive. And uh, it was a clan reunion, a big, big family reunion. So there were a lot of relatives that we did not know who they were. And uh, it was the usual party until one incident where I saw my dad just rise up from his seat because he ran to a family that I did not know who they were. And he ran like he, it was his long lost family. And he started hugging the father and the wife and the kids. And he, he was so proud of who that family was. I didn't know who they were until my dad went around introducing the father to everybody. And then he says, until when he got to me, he introduced me. He says, Odi, this is Tito Floro. And I'm like, who in the world is Tito Floro? It must be one long lost relative. And so when we were driving home, when my dad was driving home, you know, I asked the question, Dad, who is Tito Floro? And he says, oh, that's my cousin. Remember the story I told you of my cousin who shot me accidentally? That's him. And I'm like, huh? That's your cousin? But why is it that you're embracing him like he didn't handicap you and impair you for life? I mean, that's a logical question, right? And you know what my dad said? He's like, you know what? I don't want to add burden anymore to his life simply because I know he's been through so much. You know, you don't know the kind of life that he's lived. And by me forgiving him, it means the world to him. And so in that moment, I understood how it is to forgive somebody. And let me take this point home. I want to close with that final story in your mind about my dad forgiving Tito Floro. Because you see, a lot of us here, sometimes we go through our life blaming people and blaming situations and blaming our past and blaming our upbringing and blaming our ancestors for the many things that have happened in, my li in your life. But see, here's the truth that I need you to hear today. Are you listening? Again, say, I'm listening. Hate is dead weight. Let me say it again. Hate is dead weight. And a lot of you, when you're carrying your crosses in this life, you're carrying it like it's dead weight. And it's hard to carry your crosses. How many of you have crosses in, in your life? Raise your hand. You've got crosses? You're carrying that cross. And it's dead weight. And it's heavy. If you're carrying it as a cross. But do you know how Jesus carried His cross? Why he was able to carry that cross towards Calvary? You want to know why? Ask me why. One more time, ask me why. I truly believe this. That because it was for the simple reason that the weight of his love for you and me was greater than the weight of that wooden cross. He lifted that cross because He loved you and me. Now, I know you've got crosses. Crosses that you've been bearing in the form of situations, in the form of, of sin, sometimes even the form of a person. How do you lift that cross? You let love lift that cross. I'm not telling you to love your cross. Mm -mm. But I'm telling you to let your love lift that cross no matter how tired you will be my dear friends you'll be able to lift that cross all the way to the mountaintop just like what Jesus did love my dear friends it's, it changes you it lets you live this kind of life where you know that, that you can be just like Jesus in fact when Paul was talking about it you know he says love is kind it's not boastful love is all these things the Bible says that you are created in the image and likeness of God. How many of you believe that? 
when God created you, He created you to be just like Him. But over time, because of sin, because of the way that we behave in this world, we lose that identity. But that's in the very DNA that we're, we, we, we all have within ourselves. Paul wasn't simply talking about love. He was talking about God. So when he's saying love is kind, he's saying God is kind. When he's saying that love is not boastful, he's saying God is not boastful. And since you have been created in the image and likeness of God, I want us to do this together. If you can bear with me, I want us to replace that word love and read it together and then put your name instead of saying love. So for example, Odi is patient and kind. Odi is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Can we do that together as a family? Put your hand over your chest right now. On the count of three, I want you to read it as loud as you can. Here we go. One, two, three. Now I want you to concentrate again. You did it on your own, but let me read it to you again. You are patient and kind. You are not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. You do not demand your own way. You are not irritable and you keep no record of being wronged. You never give up and you never lose faith. You are always hopeful and you endure through every circumstance. Do you believe that? Do you honestly believe that? That's who you are. That's how God created you to be. God is love and He is here. trust and my full love and I believe you will bless me more so I can give more in Jesus name Amen It is so beautiful to be in the presence of God. And can we pray right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? I want you just to lift up to Him all your needs, 
whatever you're going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're coming from. He knows the burdens of your heart. Just, just bring it up to God and say, Lord, I surrender everything that all hurt and all pain and all worries and all fear. Lift them all up to you, Lord. I surrender them to you. You are my king and you are the center of my life and I trust you. And I know that you are blessing me right now. I receive your love. I receive your joy. I receive your peace. I receive your healing. I receive your provision in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Live a fantastic life.